G'day bike riders and a big welcome to all our new subscribers. I'm the Bike Route Buddy, bringing you analysis and discussion about bicycle infrastructure in Geelong and further afield. This week we are looking at the 15 reasons why someone may not be riding in a bike lane. You don't have to look very far on social media to see someone complaining about a cyclist not riding in a bike lane, and people seem to get very upset about this, as if it's the cause of their bad day. I was only going to do 10 reasons originally, but I just couldn't narrow it down so I'll entertain you with a full 15. Let's start off with a bit of background. Do bike riders have to ride in the bike lane or in an off-road path if there is one there? Let's go straight to the source and look up the Vic Roads website. On-road bicycle riding. You don't have to use an off-road bicycle path, separated footpaths or shared paths, if there is one, when riding a bike. You can choose to ride on the road instead if you wish, e.g. local roads, arterial roads and multi-lane roads, but you cannot ride on urban freeways. What about bicycle lanes? Well, if there's a bicycle lane on the road heading in the same direction as you, you must use this when riding a bike, unless it's not practical to do so. The crucial thing about bicycle lanes is, unless it is not practical to do so. So let's look at some of the reasons someone may not ride in the bicycle lane. These are not in any particular order but I will use examples from streets and roads around Geelong to demonstrate the point. Okay, starting at number one. The bike lanes are full of debris. Cars, and especially trucks, break up the road and continually break small stones off the surface, especially when a pothole forms. This debris is constantly thrown out by vehicle tyres from the traffic lanes by driving over it, where it usually ends up in the bike lane. It's not just stones though, there are all kinds of things that have fallen off trucks and cars such as bolts, nails and pieces of wood. Rubbish such as drink containers and fast food wrappers also end up in the bike lane. All the gravel from the road damage ends up in the bike lane, making it like riding on ball bearings, and sharp fragments can easily puncture a bike tyre. So you might see a bike rider moving out of the bike lane to avoid all this debris. Breakwater Road is a classic example for this. A traffic engineer once told me that damage to road goes up by the third power of the vehicle weight. That is, if you double the vehicle weight, the damage will go up eightfold. I'm not sure how accurate this is, but if there are any traffic engineers watching, let us know in the comments how close that is. Second on the list is cars parked in the bike lane. Some bike lanes allow parking, but the ones I'm referring to are where parking is not permitted. I have examples from Mallop Street and Jerringap Street in the Geelong CBD. Blocking the bike lane makes it very dangerous for bike riders, as they have to move out into traffic to go around the parked cars. Drivers often do not want to slow down and let bike riders into traffic. For a less confident rider or a kid, blocking the bike lane may turn the journey from a safe, low-stress ride into a high-risk ride that they may not be able to tolerate. If you see a car parked in a bike lane where it shouldn't be, call it out, just like you would for other law braking. Number three is where the bike lane is positioned in the car door zone. We did a whole video about these kinds of bike lanes around Geelong. The constant threat of car doors opening into your path while riding in the bike lane is enough to make sure you give all cars a wide berth. The bike lanes here along Ryrie Street are only one metre wide, and the car doors can open up to 90 centimetres, fully occupying the bike lane. A car door opening into your path as you ride by can really make your day end badly, especially if you end up crashing and a car is just passing in the traffic lane. There are a number of deaths around Australia each year from this type of incident. So if you see me riding along the white line or just outside the bike lane on this type of bike lane, it's because I don't want to be eating a car door for lunch. Fourth, are the bike lanes disguised as car parks? Or are they car parks disguised as bike lanes? There are lots of these around. This example is on Roslyn Road in Belmont. I'm not sure what the traffic engineers were on when they designed these. How can these both be a car park and a bike lane? really can only be one. Short of being able to bunny hop the cars in this type of lane, I'm going to have to ride out of the bike lane to get around them. I think in this case, it is not practical to ride in the bike lane. Number five on my list is the light sequence that heavily favours vehicles. In this example, the bike lane directs you off the road onto the shared path, and then you have to cross with people walking. If you get to the big button half a second after the lights have turned green for the traffic, you have to wait a full cycle to get through, even though it would have been green at this time. What you end up seeing is that people that ride this section a lot will just continue along the road to get the green traffic light rather than wait for the full cycle. Maybe we should switch around the priorities on the, these routes 
and have the green lights for walkers and bike riders automatic. And when a car driver wants to cross, when they stop in the sensor, it triggers a sequence for the car to cross. In many parts of the Netherlands, this is how it works, where it's always green for bike riders until a car wants to cross. Before we move on to number six, remember to click on the subscribe button and to like this video. Number six is grates in the bike lane. There are a few examples of these around. This one in particular on Moorable Street under the train bridge. You could just about lose a mountain bike tire in here. That would end your day pretty badly. There are some examples on new bicycle infrastructure, such as on Barwon Heads Road, where the grates are meant to be bicycle friendly. But I think I'm going to exit the bike lane rather than take my chances on a slippery wet grate. The seventh one I have for you is the ultra narrow bike lane. This example on the Esplanade, where it's almost impossible to fit in, not that it stops a driver from trying to fit their car in it. This example could feature in number 10 also. The best option here is to take the traffic climb completely when the traffic is moving, and maybe use the bike lane when the traffic is stopped. Number 8 is a common occurrence when approaching an intersection. It seems that drivers either don't see you or ignore you when they want to do a left turn. I don't know how many times I've approached an intersection and a driver comes past and turns left straight into my path. This commonly occurs at roundabouts, when the drivers are looking for traffic on the roundabout. Is the driver of this van going to turn left here into Glenleith Avenue? There are plenty of examples of this left hook manoeuvre on the internet, and it is always the bike rider that ends up second best. So if I'm in the traffic lane approaching an intersection or roundabout, it is to try to prevent a driver from left hooking me. Number 9. Often the bike lane just ends for no reason. Check out these examples on Barrable Road, where there is a bike symbol on the road, and then the line just sends you into the gutter. Or another example on Barrable Road near the Barwon River, where there is a bike lane sign, but I can't see a bike lane. Here is another one near Highton Village. According to the signs, the bike lane keeps going, but according to the plane on the road, it just ended. Here is another great example of a bike lane just ending along Moorable Street before it crosses the Barwon River. And yes, I know there is a protected bike lane on the other side of the road, but there's not a practical route if you wanted to go down Barwon Heads Road, as there is no crossing to get across Moorable Street on the other side of the bridge, and crossing four lanes of traffic at 60 km per hour is not exactly attractive. There is a narrow path on the left-hand side of the bridge, but that can be quite difficult to get onto, as cars waiting to turn left often block the entry. So if I'm not in the bike lane in these sections, it's because I can't find the bike lane. Number 10 is the old adage that paint isn't protection. The most common type of bike lane in Geelong is the painted gutter bike lane. It seems that a white line on the road and telling drivers not to cross it is all the protection you get when you're on your bike. Let's have a look at the rules around this from Vic Roads. Bicycle lane rules for drivers. If you're driving a car, you're not allowed to drive in the bike lane unless you're driving for 50 metres or less to enter the, or leave the road, to turn at an intersection, overtake a vehicle that's turning right or making a U-turn from the centre of the road, avoid an obstruction, get from one part of the road to another, enter the traffic stream after being parked on the side of the road, pick up or drop off passengers if you're driving a public bus, public minibus or taxi, or there's a sign indicating that vehicles can use the lane. Crucially, you must give way to cyclists already in the bicycle lane. So if all I've got is a bit of magic paint to protect me from cars cutting me off, I might not ride in the bike lane. I might ride in the lane so that drivers will hopefully stay behind me until it's safe to pass. This is one I've shown before from Roslyn Road. And here's another one from Roslyn Road. I've got a couple from Mallisp Street. This is one heading east, and another heading west. Not only did the driver drive in the bike lane and not meet the, one of the criteria, the driver also turned right when it is a left turn only out of the car park. And people say that bike riders don't follow the road rules. Here is one I mentioned earlier in number 7 that fits into two categories. I was originally only going to do 10, but I thought there are a few more I needed to discuss. The 11th one is that the bike lanes didn't get built. The Southern Link Stage 2 was fully designed, fully funded, and the tender was about to be awarded. This would have been a great link from the river trails up to the Belmont shops, and it would have made Belmont High Street a nice place to be, with tree cover, traffic calming, and better facilities for walking and riding. Belmont High Street has so much parking within the block that a few car parks to be removed in the High Street would have had minimal impact. Here is what the councillors had to say. 
And what we were left with was that a proposal where we had no winners and losers, we actually had losers and losers. Um, the TAC is on board and the Department of Transport's on board um, and we'll get the community on board and we'll build the right bike paths in the right places for everyone. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Nelson. This councillor thinks that putting the bike lanes in would have resulted in losers and losers. I'm just not sure how street trees, traffic calming and a full street redevelopment and some road space allocated to encourage active transport is a lose-lose situation. Seems to me that not developing High Street is more of a lose-lose situation and this is what we're left with now. In this meeting in November 2022, we hear that everyone is on board and we will build the right bike paths in the right places. Obviously that was just talk. Here we are 20 months later and the right bike paths in the right places have never been talked about again. And the money to redevelop High Street Belmont has been handed back to the TAC. If you were wondering, the first councillor speaking was Councillor Aitken and the second one was Councillor Nelson. So if you don't see me riding in the bike lane in Belmont High Street, it's because they didn't get built. Number 12. I might not be riding this bike lane as there are signs in them. The placement of signs to alert drivers of something are often placed in the bike lanes and the footpaths. This often creates a safety hazard as riders have to go onto the road to get around them or even have to drop off a curb. Not to mention how difficult it would be for anyone in a wheelchair or with mobility difficulties. This is a common problem. So let's look at what the Victorian Department of Transport had to say about this in 2020 in the Signs and Specifications Background Paper number 3. From Section 5, the following principles should be applied for the use of traffic signage during construction. Signage should not impact negatively on pedestrians and cyclists, e.g. should not obstruct their path. They should communicate to drivers the need to acknowledge pedestrians and cyclists and their safety. And from the same document in section 5.1, as specified under AS 1742.3, Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, Traffic Control Devices for Works on Roads, 2019, section 4.3.2, construction signage for traffic should not impede pedestrians and cyclists. Under best practice, there are recommendations made to how obstructions can be avoided or kept to a minimum. Figure 7 and Figure 8 illustrate typical bad practice in the placement of VMS and other signs which frequently obstruct both pedestrians and cycle path lanes. It goes on to say, placement needs to ensure adequate width for pedestrians to pass. It took me about 10 minutes to look this up. I'm not sure why the professional traffic management companies don't seem to know this. I was interested in looking at the Australian Standard AS 1742.3 2019 that was mentioned, but at $219.67, that is $219.67 over budget, and the income from this YouTube channel just doesn't quite cover it. I guess the professional traffic management companies should look this up and at least try to comply. Just three more to go. Number 13, they are just closed. Bike lanes are often just closed with nothing but a sign to say they are closed and sometimes not even a sign. Regional Rail just closed this section and expected bike riders to just ride the wrong way down a one-way street with cars rat running along Car Street. So if I was going the wrong way down this bit of road and not on the path, this is why. Cadenia Park redevelopment also just closed the bike lane and people walking and riding were forced to walk ride on the road. We covered this in detail on one of our videos on the Southern Bike Link. Number 14, I might not be riding in this bike lane because it's not actually a bike lane. The definition of a bike lane in Victoria is, bike lanes are on-road lanes reserved for bike riders, identified with bike symbol on the road and a sign which says it's a bike lane. There are many road shoulders around and lines on the road that many people think indicate that it's a bike lane, when in fact it's just a road shoulder. If I'm not riding in there, even though some people think it's a bike lane when it's not, I'm under no obligation at all to keep to the left of this line. Usually I'll try to because I don't enjoy holding people up, but sometimes it's just not safe to do so. Finally, number 15. When riding with young kids, it's usually best to ride in the footpath, and that is perfectly okay according to Vic Roads. You can ride in a footpath if you are a child under 13 or are a person 13 and over who is accompanying a child under the age of 13. But when my child turns 13, they are no longer allowed to ride on the footpath, and therefore I am not allowed to either, even when I'm accompanying them. So we then have to ride on the road. Most parents don't think it's safe for 13-year-olds to be riding on most of our roads on their own. So, it's, so it is at this stage when most kids ditch the bike and become passengers in their parents' taxis. 
Victoria and New South Wales are the only Australian states that do not permit people riding on the footpaths, and this doesn't look like catching up with the other states soon. South Australia and Tasmania usually cop abuse for being behind the times, but in this case, it is Victoria dragging the chain. So let's look at Tasmania. They are allowed to ride in the footpath and across pedestrian crossings. And South Australia, cyclists of all ages are allowed to ride in the footpath. New South Wales is much the same as Victoria, but you can ride in the footpath until the day you turn 16. Then you're fighting it out with the cars. So there you have it. 15 reasons why I might not be riding the bike lane and will be riding in the traffic lane. Also, remember the road rules when you see a bike rider in the traffic lane. You don't have to use an off-road bicycle path, separated footpath or shared path, if there is one, when riding a bike. If there's a bicycle lane on the road heading in the same direction as you, you must use this when riding a bike, unless it's not practical to do so. And the practical part is the discretion of the bike rider, not anyone else. Let me know in the comments if you know of any other reasons for not riding the bike lanes. I'm the Bike Route Buddy. Don't forget to click on the subscribe button and to like this video. Thanks for watching. I'll see you out riding in a high quality bicycle network where you don't have to leave the bike lane and interact with cars.